just uh, got a bit late getting there. Playing basketball with my grandkids and got behind a little bit. But, uh, here we are as we begin this morning, chapter 6, again continuing in the book of John. And as you can see from the title, we're talking about the characteristics of true false disciples or Christians, if you want that word, versus disciples. It just means learner. And I'll hit that in a few minutes, what that is. And you know, in, um, if you've ever been to Hawaii or you know about Hawaii, Hawaii there is an, ex, uh, an extinct volcano, and it is called Diamond Head. And uh, Ono, the Isle, Isle of Oahu, now it got its name from the Western explorers that came there because from a distance they saw the shining uh, rocks there on, on the slopes that were embedded, and, and it looked like diamonds. So they did it, but closer examination found out they were just worthless crystals. I think this calcite, C A L C I T E, is actually the, the crystal. So it was worthless. It really just looked like it from a distance, but not when you really examined it. So, in a similar way, there are many who look like Christians from a distance, Christ's disciples, but when we take a closer look, or investigate a little bit closer shows that they are not really what they claim. Some people shine outwardly like diamonds, but inside they are nothing really but worthless rocks. Jesus called them whitewashed dead men's tombs. But the New Testament describes them as tares among the wheat in Matthew 13, 25-30. A bad fish that is thrown away in, in Matthew 13, 48. Um, goats condemned to eternal hell in Matthew 25, uh, 33, uh, verses 35, 25, 33, and 41, etc. We could just go through many other passages. There are apostates who eventually leave the fellowship according to 1 John 2, 19. They manifest an evil, unbelieving heart, abandoning the living God. In Hebrews 3.12. They continue to sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth in Hebrews 10.26. And they fall away from the truth to everlasting destruction verse 39 of that chapter. They think they are on their way to heaven though. When actually they are on their road on the broad path as it talks about in Matthew 7. That leads to hell. Matthew 7.13-14. They are deceived. And because of the serious danger of being deceived, the Bible stresses the cost of being a genuine, true disciple of Christ. One would be one would be follower came to Jesus and, and said to Jesus, "Lord, permit me. Uh, how can um, God be one of your disciples?" Basically, he came to Jesus. And said, Lord, permit me first though, to go and to bury my father in Matthew 8, 21. Now, this was just a figure of speech, meaning, wait until I receive my inheritance. And Jesus replied, follow me and allow the spiritually dead to bury their own dead in verse 22. And then in, in Luke, Luke records Jesus' sobering warning to count carefully the cost of following him in verses 27 through um, 35. That's Luke 14. 27. 27. And, and whosoever does not bear the cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost where, whether he have a sufficient to finish it? Lest Happily, after he had laid the foundation and it is it, and is not able to finish it all, that behold, it becomes a mock. Be, began to mock him, excuse me, saying, "This man began to build and was not able to finish." Or, "What king goeth to make war against another king? Sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him." that cometh after him with 20,000. Or else why, or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an, an 
Nebu. Ambassador Ann desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever be he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill or manure pile, but man cast it out. He that hath ears hear and let him hear. So Jesus gives us his own warning that to be careful, to count the cost of becoming a disciple. To, to his disciples, even to Jesus, to his disciples, he said, he warned them uh, to love him above all else, even one's own death in Matthew 10 34 and short through 37 think not that I have I came come to send peace on earth I came not to send peace but a sword for I am come to set a man at variance or at war or hostility against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. See, it also means to love him more than life itself, you see. Jesus in, in Luke nine twenty three through uh, 24 was saying, was saying to them, all. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever wishes to save his life or his soul will lose it. The Greek word actually is soul there. But whosoever loses his soul or life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. See, Jesus wasn't speaking or talking about um, the general trials of life when he was talking when he had reference to the cross or he wasn't even referencing Calvary why? he had not yet suffered there so he wasn't referring to those things but his readers understood his point perfectly it meant death and only true disciples are willing to submit to Christ's lordship in everything We've seen that over the Middle East when, when people were beheaded because they believed. Can you imagine that? We haven't gone through that yet, but these people were willing to give their life. So that's what Jesus was talking about. Not the cry, not the everyday things we go through, the trials and all that. He was talking about, and they knew he was talking about death. Are we willing to die for Christ? Do we love him enough to die for him? Do you love your wife and your kids enough to die for them? Do you love him enough? And only true believers are willing to do that. I mean, if you're not a true believer, why would you die for a Savior you don't believe in or you don't think is real? So that's what he was talking about. Submit to the Lordship in everything in our lives, even if it means persecution and execution. As I just mentioned, no price is too high for eternal life. Now, in contrast, the false disciples fall apart. They go away when the, when the going gets tough. They leave. Sometimes I wonder if COVID and the churches just being merged because churches that had two services aren't having two services anymore, can't get the people back in the church. Is the church being purged? Times got tough, right? Oh, God, where are you? Why am I, everybody getting sick? Why is everybody dying of COVID? Why do I have to get COVID? You see, they fall away and they challenge God when it gets tough. You see, when affliction or persecution arises because of the word or the worry of the world, and the deceitfulness of the wealth choke the word in Matthew 13, 21 to 22, talking about the seeds. It chokes it out, and they leave. They weren't really believers in the first place. They were just kind of followers there. You see, they showed their true colors. And such false disciples do not come to Christ to bow before him as the Lord and Savior. But rather, they come seeking their own personal gain. When their selfish desires do not materialize, they fall away altogether. They just fall away. Now this chapter 16 shows that not all disciples are true believers 
in Christ. It needs to be noted that the disciples are not spiritual classes of who are actively pursuing sanctification. It's just a class. It shows that not all but true believers are disciples, but not all disciples are true believers. As I've just mentioned, you can see why. Verses 16 through 19 uh, comprise of two, pass, two passages that set the stage for the discourse of the bread of life. And even after Jesus gives that discourse of the bread of life that we'll see later, after he does that, many leave him. So we see they weren't true disciples, but they thought they were disciples. They looked like they were disciples from a distance. They show also the contrast between the true and false disciples or believers or Christians, whatever you want to do. So in 16 through 21, you see the true disciples' response. Jesus is walking on the water. This is the last time we saw Jesus there in the boat. He is walking on the water. This is the fifth miraculous sign that John records. In keeping with his purpose, it demonstrates Christ's deity, deity by revealing his power over the laws of nature. In contrast to the false disciples of verses 22 to 29, it shows the reverence response of true believers or disciples. So we see the supernatural sign in verses 16 through 19. When Jesus dismissed the crowd, we go back to last week, they wanted to make him king in 14 and 15, and Jesus refused that, so he dismissed the disciples. Jesus also sent the crowd away, but he also sent his disciples away, Matthew 14, 22. There was no doubt the excitement, the excitement of the crowd, the excited crowd, and the response to that, um, that there was getting to them. We would have been caught up into it too. All the excitement going around and everything else. You see, the disciples, their master, Jesus, was finally, they thought, finally getting the honor that he was due. You see, Jesus had taught them to pray for the kingdom of God to come in Matthew 6.10. And it looked like that prayer was being answered. So they were all excited about it. But Jesus knew their hearts. And not wanting them to get caught up or swept up, whatever you want to say, in the crowd's superficial enthusiasm, which is true, we see that today. People get caught up in the enthusiasm of coming to Christ because he's doing all these things. We've heard a miracle in this life. You know, he's going to do this. He solved the marriage problems. He did this. And we get excited about it. We And we want to get it. But he says, no, I don't want you to get up, caught up in the uh, superficial enthusiasm. So Jesus removes them from that situation. Now, they most likely did not understand, but they obeyed him anyway. You can see they're thinking, well, wait a minute, they're doing it, why not? But Jesus knows the hearts of people, and he knew it was just superficial. You see, they were initially headed to Bethsaida, not far from where they had the feeding in, in Mark uh, 6.45, planning to meet Jesus there before casting, uh, crossing, casting, sorry, crossing the lake to the western shore Capernaum in Matthew uh, 1434 and Mark 653. These passages are just related. I'm going back and forth so you can see the situation and see how it all fits together using the different, using all the books of the Bible to bring these, this event uh, to life that we can understand it. So it says, When evening came, the disciples went down to the sea, and after getting into the boat, into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. Now, evening here refers to the second evening from sunset to dark. Now they waited in Bethsaida till it was dark. Now Jesus hadn't come, so um, because it says it had already become dark. And since Jesus had not yet come to them, they decided they were going to set out for Capernaum anyway. So they got into their boat. Now this is a fishing boat, not a big boat. Uh, most fishing boats aren't, except some of them you see on the high seas today. But anyway, it's just, they're not that big either. So now the Sea of Galilee, just for some background, is about 700 feet below sea level. The hills around it slope up though, a little over 2,000 feet, I guess, above sea level. Now, when you look at the top of the mountain, down to the water surface, there's a sharp 3,000-foot drop from the top of the surface, okay? Now, this is ideal for the condition that suddenly these violent storms would come up. That cool air rushes down the slopes with great force, creating white caps, dangerous for small boats like the fishermen's boat. Now, as they started across uh, the lake towards Capernaum, they were caught in one of those storms. Now, John recalls it. He says, The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. 
it was so strong, it blew the boat off course, okay? Now, it says it, it a long distance from the land. You remember that in Matthew 14, 24. Toward the middle of the sea, Sea of Galilee, Mark 6, 47. That's why you need the scriptures to understand what's going on. Now, a sail would not have helped them because they were bucking the wind. The disciples continued straining at the oars in Mark 6, 48. They were constantly trying to get this boat to go. And the disciples left for a companion between the hours of 6 and 9 p.m., John 6, 16. And according to Matthew 14, 25 and Mark 6, 48, it was now the fourth watch of the night, about 3 to 6 in the morning. Think about that. Between 6 and 9, between 3 and 6, either way, 6 to 3, 9 to 6. A long time in these dark hours. They're exhausted. They've been rowing this boat. Structural hours, they weren't getting anywhere. They had rowed only about two, I mean, about three or four miles, the scripture says right there. Meanwhile, Jesus is on the mountain praying. In verse chapter 6, verse 15, Matthew, Matthew 14, 23, and Mark 6, 46. Where you say, well, what is he doing? Well, he's being the great shepherd. He's praying. But he had not forgotten his disciples, see. In his infinite wisdom, he planned on helping them in his perfect timing. You see, divine sovereignty and omnipotence uh, and omnipotence are never in a hurry. The disciples never could have really imagined what that help would have looked like. But Jesus had not forgotten them. Suddenly, through the storm, the raging storm, they see Jesus walking on the sea or the water, whatever your translation is, and drawing near to the boat. Now here they have been struggling for hours, making little headway. And here comes Jesus moving so fast that the disciples thought that he was going to pass right by them in Mark 6, 48. I mean, he's just moving right along. Here they hadn't gotten anywhere, bucking that wind and the waves and the mist and here comes Jesus just walking on that water like nothing was going on. And because of the darkness, the wind, and the water spray up into their face, they did not recognize him who was walking on the water toward the boat. Now, about seven of these disciples were fishermen. And were used to being on the lake and at night, and even in rough weather times. But because the waves threatened to swamp the boat in, in Mark 4, in, uh, Mark 4.37, Luke 8.23, they were familiar with these types of storms. But they were not accustomed to seeing human figures walking on the water. Imagine that. Just think, they're going through all this rowing. They're worried about the boat be, to be sunk with the waves. And here they, they see this, this coming, and they can barely make it out because of the waves are, are rocking in the boat, and the mist is blowing in their face, and they're not too. So not surprisingly, they were what? Frightened. And cried out in terror. It is a ghost. And a lot of people believe in ghosts today, and back then they really did. And so, you know, they'd seen demons cast out and everything else. So they, they thought, well, it's a ghost. In Matthew 14, 26, Mark 6, 49. I can say these are normal chapters that go along with this. But like all Jesus' miracles, folks, the Lord walking on the water was not a trick. By suspending the laws of gravity, he gave his disciples a visual proof that he is the creator and controller of the physical forces. Now, some people say, some of the liberal theologians that don't want to believe this, so I want to take this miracle away. And I forgot to put this in my notes, but I remembered it. They say that Jesus was walking on the seashore, and that's what they saw. Now, it says that the boat was in the middle of the thing, about three or four miles or more than that, the, the words there that are in there. It was in the middle of the lake. There's no way that they could see that. But see, they want to explain away the miracle of Jesus walking on the water because it proves his deity and his, as I said, of his power as the creator and controller of the physical universe. So we hear all those things that go on today. Now, the disciples 
did not initially recognize Jesus, as I just mentioned, as he approached. So the Lord knew what was going along, so he claimed, so he so he calmed, excuse me, calmed the panic stricken disciples, take courage, Matthew fourteen, twenty seven, Mark six fifty. It is I, do not be afraid. Recognizing Jesus, they were looking for him, they wanted him, recognizing Jesus, the disciples were willing and glad to receive him into the boat. Can you believe that? There you are, in that boat. Now the disciples, like all true disciples of Jesus, longed for his presence. There were no they they were not they were definitely disappointed when Jesus did not meet them before they started across the lake in verses 16 and 17. To their astonishment and relief, he had returned to them in an unexpected way, you see. But they were overjoyed. Now, the bold and impetuous um, Peter could not wait for Jesus to get in the boat. So Peter asked him if he could come on the water in Matthew 14, 28 through 31. I was going to read that. Uh, passage, but we know Peter came out on the water, and and Peter I started looking at the circumstances around him, and Peter sunk. But I didn't want to concentrate on, on that. And Jesus lifts him back, back up out of the the water in in, in Matthew fourteen uh, twenty eight through thirty one. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship or the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind and the blisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried for Jesus, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, therefore didst thou doubt. See, Peter doubted. Do we doubt all these miracles? Do we doubt Christ can really help us in our life? Peter reached out and says, help me. When we have trials and trouble, that's what we need to do. We need to go to Jesus and ask for help. Do we doubt that he won't? Do we, do we believe that he can help us? Uh, Peter found out. The story of Jesus walking on the water includes not one miracle, but four. Well, not just Jesus walking on the, on the water, which is a miracle, but also did Peter, for a few moments, he even walked on the water. Matthew and Mark record the wind immediately stopped when Jesus got into the boat. Matthew 14, 32, Mark 6, 51, another miracle. And the fourth one, finally, John records the fourth. Immediately, the boat was at the land to which they were going. A miraculous miracle. You imagine the boat, here they've been rowing all that night long. The storm stops, and all of a sudden they're on shore. All those miracles for walking on the water, those four took place. Probably blew their minds. Did you ever notice that in that passage? You see, there's always something to learn. Astonished, those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. Now, one other time when Jesus got a storm, they said, What what matter of man is this? This time, their hearts are a little different. They have matured. And they said, You are certainly God's son. Matthew 14, 33. That is the appropriate response, folks. As did the wise men as they came after Jesus' birth in, in Matthew 2.11. A Canaanite woman in, in Matthew 15.25. The blonde man Jesus healed in John 9.36. Thomas after he saw Jesus uh, in the room, John 20.28. 20, and there's others. That's the response. Even Peter at one other time said he's a, with, with the fish, he said and he worshipped him. I'm a sinful man. Although they were amazed by Jesus' miracles, the disciples, the twelve, responded as all true followers of Jesus Christ with adoration and worship. Let's look at the response of the false disciples in verses 22 through 29. The crowd Jesus fed also witnessed their creative power, but did not respond with heartfelt worship. They responded with selfishness and greed. What was the sign in 22 through 24? After crossing to the western shore during the night, the scene, the next day, it says, it shifted back to the east side of the lake. Some of the crowd that had witnessed Jesus' healing in, 
Okay, verse 2. And been miraculously fed, verses 3 through 13, stood the following morning on the other side of the sea, the eastern side, back towards where they were fed. They had spent the night there, Matthew 14, 22, and Mark 6, 45. Okay. They were looking for him, Jesus, hoping for another free meal, verse 26, and maybe still wanting to make him king. They still had that on their mind. They finally thought something was wrong. They were looking around. There were no other small boats there the day before except the one the disciples used. Now, they knew that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Now, the mystery was there with, where was Jesus? The crowd did not witness Jesus walking on the water by night. They wanted to know, where was he? Verse 23. How be it, there came other boats from Tyrus, telling you where it is, night unto the place where they did eat bread after the Lord had given thanks. Now, this is a parenthesis. It's just telling you that these small boats, where they came from, that transported the crowd to Capernaum, came from Tiberus. It was just a big city. It was a city that they used a lot in those days. Why were they there? Well, maybe because the owner of the boats heard about the feeding and came to investigate. Or maybe because they came to pick up the friends or loved ones that and were maybe became water taxis and seeing to make some money because of the large crowd. Now the crowd finally, think the crowd finally realizes that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples. So they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. They said, we're going to go find him. We, 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 we see him in Capernaum. Jesus that was Jesus' adopted hometown in Matthew 4.13. So that would have been the logical place to look for him, right? Now the crowd sought Jesus in, in, in verse 25. And when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. They came seeking Jesus in verse 4. They did so really for the wrong reasons. They followed him for what they could get. They were not interested in worshiping or obeying him. You see, they came to see what they could get from him. Maybe another meal. Maybe they wanted to see more miracles. I'll probably mention that. But why did you come to Jesus? Why are people coming to Jesus today? We have this health and wealth preaching. They come for wealth. They come for, uh, for health, to get healed, to get their marriage done, to be successful in their jobs, to get money. Are we coming the same way? Are people seeking Jesus for the wrong reasons because we're not preaching verse by verse, line by line, chapter by chapter, book by book? Are we afraid to talk about sin anymore? So why are people coming to Jesus? You can have your best day ever. Nothing ever goes wrong. God's going to give you everything you wish. Well, that's what these people were doing too. So they're not so much different than us, are they? That human nature is taking over. I want another meal. I want to see more miracles. We're always looking for signs for Jesus. Show me you're real. Do this. Do that. Uh, help me with this job. Help me with this. Help me with that. Give me this. Give me that. So we're, they're not so much wrong. They weren't interested in worshiping. The world can see what they could get out of it. Prosperity. Health. Wealth. Our marriage is such a happy. Well, persecution is coming to the Christian community. It started already. So if you're looking for that, you're going to have the wrong reason. And then you're going to be like those that came and were choked out by the world. The response is in verses 25 through 29. When they found Jesus, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? See, they knew something was different. See, they hadn't seen anything. They had no idea how Jesus got there. It was a mystery to them. Jesus did not answer their question. Telling them of another spectacular miracle. Why? Because it maybe would have fueled their misguided messianic fever. Remember, they wanted to make him king. They may have gotten it all stirred back up again, giving him more hope. Because the Lord did not commit himself to thrill-seeking false disciples. Back in the first part of chapter 6 of the Bible. Jesus says, truly, truly, and we know that introduces an important truth. Jesus rebuked them. You seek me not because you saw things, saw signs, 
but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. You see, same as the day. We want something from him. They want food from him. They want him to give them everything, and they want to fill their bellies. You see, that laid bare their selfish hearts, so blinded by their superficial desire for food and miracles that they missed the true spiritual significance of Jesus' person and mission. They were moved not by full hearts, but by full bellies. We just want our bank accounts full. We just want everything to go hunky-dory. No problems, no nothing. That's what we, some people, are coming to Jesus for. Even after they had witnessed the miracle, miraculous signs Jesus had performed, they failed to grasp the spiritual implications of those miracles. Jesus rebuked the crowd for their materialism. All the things they were wanting. Instead of working for the food which perishes physical, Jesus exhorted them to pursue the food which endure to eternal life. Instead of focusing on the decaying outer person, they needed to seek the spiritual nourishment, which only the Son of Man, Jesus, can give. As the one in whom the Father, God, has set his seal of approval on. In response to Jesus' command in verse 22, to pursue the spiritual food, non-perishing of eternal life, they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the work of God? They filtered Jesus' words and sayings through their minds. They needed to do some work for eternal life. They filtered this and turned his words all around like we do today. We turn them around. We do that. We try to work our way to heaven just like this. See, they filtered his words. And so they thought they needed to do some kind of work to earn eternal life. Remember the rich young ruler? He asked the same question in Matthew 19, 16. And in Luke 20, 25, the lawyer did the same thing. It was a familiar matter for the, for the Jews to pursue eternal life through what? Their religion. Their religion was the works religion. It's today, too. We have a lot of churches that, that are dealing with a works salvation and works don't save you. They can't save you. They be filthy rags. You see, true salvation is not of works. Titus 3, 5. Jesus answered by noting that the only work acceptable to God is to believe in him who he has sent. Jesus Christ. God in human flesh. Believe in him who he has sent. Jesus. They knew what he was talking about. Salvation is by grace alone. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Through faith alone, Romans 3.28. In Christ alone, in Acts 4.12. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Romans 3.20, Galatians 2.16. Salvation is the gift of God, John 4.10. Romans 5.15, 6.23, Ephesians 2.8. There is no other way. So salvation does not come from human effort, achievement, or moral work, but from a faith that inevitably produces good works, Ephesians 2.10, and etc. A faith that does not produce fruit is dead, meaning that it is not really biblical faith at all, James 2.14-16. True disciples. Worship Christ, true disciples produce fruit. Fruit that is lasting, Ephesians, I mean, 2 Corinthians 15. All the works we do ourselves is burned up. All the human, only the works that we do for Jesus Christ. And the only way we can do that is know him as our personal Savior and have his spirit come into our lives, accepting his death on the cross of Calvary on our behalf, paying the penalty of our death. Have you done that? Well, the signs are true, and nobody knows when it's going to come back. I mentioned something to somebody talking about the rapture, and I said, I didn't say when it was coming. I, I wouldn't dare do that. It's not coming, but the signs are there. We're seeing more fulfilled prophecy today than we ever have. We're seeing the persecution of Christians and church and all its subtle movements, but it's coming. You sit there, we're, uh, we're, we're just really run down the hoops with all of this, this stuff, you see. And they're harassing us, and it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Do you know him today? And you can do that by asking him into your life. Let me pray. Father, again, we just thank you for this time that you've given us this morning. Father, in all my little mistakes and corrections, and Father, we just ask you to use this, Father, just to help people just understand what went on in this scene, Father, that you have there, these miraculous miracles. And we see by putting the Scripture together the whole story and help us to understand it more, Father, and grasp the reality 
uh, who you are. And Father, those that don't know you, may this help them. And those that have maybe weak faith or maybe that have walked away, may hear this, use this, Father, to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.